Hello, this is Jackie B. Peterson, and welcome to Solo Pro Radio. I look forward to talking with you today. I have great uh, information to share with you at the same time. By now, I'm sure you're pretty familiar with Better, Smarter, Richer, which is our workbook that it talks about the seven principles that it takes to be successful as a solopreneur. As you all know, solopreneurship is growing as the most popular and actually easiest business model in the 21st century. It's just kind of like it's made for our time. So go to my website, bettersmarterrichard.com, and take a look at the blog, sign up for the free newsletter, uh, listen to a lot of the radio shows, and of course, if you have an opportunity, buy the book. We'd love to have you join the workbook, or you can take our online class and study what it takes to be successful as a solopreneur, because there's so many of you doing business that way. I'd like to point out a, a couple of events coming up here in September. On September 11th, we at the Portland Community College Small Business Development Center are beginning our first Encore Entrepreneur Program. We're talking about how to develop your business concept. That will happen on September 11th. And contact the Small Business Development Center at Portland Community College if that's you, if you're interested in in creating your Encore business. And on September 17th from 6 to 9 p.m., in the Portland Community College Climb Center, that's at the corner of Water and Clay in Southeast Portland, we will be having a free seminar about solopreneurship and better, smarter, richer. Love to see you at both of those. There is just great things happening, and you know it's always the right time to start your small business, and it certainly is the time to know that you can make money and be financially successful doing what you love. Again, go to the website, bettersmarterrichard.com, and take a look. So my guest today is Star Shepherd Decker. She's a teacher, a law of attraction coach, musician, activist, spiritual leader, and the founder of Radical Revelations. Her gift and passion is helping spiritual nonconformists, love that term, break down their inner walls that keep them stuck, small, and searching in a system that may or may not support their needs. She loves watching what happens when we let go of old programming and review our unique inner light. Believe in that too, Star. Hello, Star. Hi, Jackie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Me too. I'm looking forward to talking with you. I like what you say about what you're doing, but starting with, you know, the background before we get to the meat, why don't you tell us about yourself and your journey and, and you know, how did you, how did you go from growing up and going to school and kind of what you studied and, you know, tell us your pathway of how you got to being a, a guide who helps spiritual nonconformists. Absolutely. Well, I started out, uh, as everyone does, going to school, usual stuff. Um, I grew up in Southern California, Orange County, Huntington Beach to be specific, um, though I went to school in Fountain Valley because I was in the honors and gifted program. Um, and then I, uh, I lived with my mom, single mom, single daughter. And then I didn't live with my mom at the age of 12, and I moved in with her mom. Pretty much, so I pretty much was raised mostly by my mom and her mom um, my entire life. And then at 19... Um, I got pregnant and moved to Portland. <laughs> and I will say, uh, before, you know, you know, in high school, I always kind of had a rebellious spirit. I boycotted certain places, like I boycotted McDonald's because they were cutting down the rainforest. You know, this is when I was like eight. Um, and needless to say, that type of mentality wasn't um, encouraged in Orange County. <laughs> it was like, well, that's going to get in the way of, you know, you being the CEO of the, of the company, you know. Um, and so I got pregnant at 19, moved up to Portland, and it was really refreshing to meet conscious, awake people here. Um, I always had a spiritual draw. You know, I, I dabbled in meditation. I think I dabbled in, like, Wicca um, paganism in high school a little bit. I was never really interested um, in mainstream, you know, Christianity. And then I was introduced to um, what's now called the Centers for Spiritual Living, um, shortly after I divorced my first husband, and it became the thing that saved me. And so kind of my impetus for growth um, along this path was I lost custody of my uh, two children from my previous marriage. And um, as a mother, you know, the, just the, stig- the, the cultural stigma that goes with not having custody of your kids is pretty heavy. Um, but also wow. not having your kids is pretty heavy. 
And so, how many children um, do you have? I now have three. I had two oh, wow. in previous marriage. And they so teach they were, you a lot. Were, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I'm all boys. And so uh, they were three and almost two when that happened. And I spent about a year and a half fighting for custody and lost. And so, you know, that was the time in my life where I could, and I dabbled, um, you know, just gone and partied and gone to bars and drank my sorrows away, um, which I I did that for a little bit. Um, But instead, I started taking classes at the Portland Center for Spiritual Living um, and was really amazed and empowered by this idea that I could create my own life, that I didn't have to be a victim to the stuff that was happening which, of course, you know, in the situation I was in was, was something I needed to grab onto with some power. And so um, wow. through, years of taking, That's big. through years of taking classes, yeah. I mean, it, just looking back, I mean, that was 12 years ago, and I can't even really remember how that felt because it was pretty, you know, there were some hard years there. Just the first five years, I think I got through it thinking that I would get custody back, which um, in Oregon isn't really realistic unless something bad happens where they are, and I'm not going to... I know how the law of attraction works. I'm not going to affirm that something bad has to happen to my kids for me to get custody of them. So, um, yeah. so I've just had to continuously live with that. And then they moved to Medford about a year and a half after we separated. And so I don't get to see them very often. They come up here when school's out. And so like I just um, said goodbye to them a couple weeks ago, and then I won't get to see them again until Thanksgiving. And so you know, that in itself gets to be my constant work my constant inner work um, wow. to, to yeah. get my grief and my <laughs> loss. Um, and, you know, I was raised by some women who lived very unhealthy lives and carried around a lot of baggage and didn't have healthy relationships and um, had a lot of drama. And I knew that in order to not be that, I was going to have to do some inner work. And so that's mm-hmm. really um, been my impetus for taking this path, for staying on this path, for continuing to do my inner work. And then because of the changes I've seen in my own life, um, it's like yeah. I, I, want, I want to give this to other people because I know that there's other people that have, you know, gone through stuff worse and, and the same and different and all that. And so wow. me, it's really important. And, and you know, it's a tremendous way to learn things is to teach it to other people. <laughs> Exactly. Yes, we teach what we're what we're working on. <laughs> yes. Yes. And yeah. So this is this is something I'm constantly working on. Yeah. Wow. That's a big story. That's a big story. And so and good for you. I mean, good for you to um, see something different and go after it. You know, it, it takes it yeah. takes courage and it takes strength and dedication and commitment and you know because um, it's so easy to fall back into old habits particularly when they are part of our growing up you know and uh, part of things that we just um, do on automatic pilot you know whereas to do something different we have to stop and think about it you know we have to be attentive and and um, that's hard so good for you it is well thank you thank you and I'd say the hardest part is um, just not on you know not being able to explain it in a small little thing because it was kind of a you know it's kind of a big deal and people want to know and and that there's yeah. that judgment of like oh my gosh what did you do to lose custody of your children <laughs> you know yeah yeah and so you know that in itself it's you know i just have to own my own truth and know that i'm, yeah. that I'm being the best mom that i can you know and my yeah. kids are amazing they're 15 and 14 now and they're you know they they're going to school they're really smart they're really fun we have great times together we have great relationships we just don't get to interact as much as I'd like yeah yeah so you're special yeah <laughs> there you go <laughs> indeed indeed and yeah oh so yeah that's cool. how, that's how so, I got here that's how you got here yeah big journey big 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 life lessons good for you so yeah, thank you what what is a spiritual nonconformist? Let's talk about that. Yeah, so you know, as I'm sure that you know in marketing and all that kind of stuff, your first task is to decide who it is that you're talking to. Mm-hmm. And I came up with the term spiritual nonconformist to really describe this person who um has never really fit into the box, knows that they don't fit into the box. Um, and yet struggle with how to continue to, you know, do work and show up and pay bills and, and live life in alignment with their values, 
knowing what they know, um, seeing the system and seeing, you know, how we're treating our environment, seeing how we're treating people. And, um, and then the spiritual part is, you know, it doesn't really have to be of, of any specific flavor, but just somebody who has a sense of something bigger than themselves. Mm-hmm. That, you know, that they don't think that it's just them, because if we think it's just us, we can get really exhausted. And yeah. if we can tap into something bigger than ourselves, then we can use that as we move forward. And so those are my people. <laughs> um, yeah. And, so, you know, anybody who has a spiritual sense and knows that they want to do something different, and you know, something different than their parents did. Like you said, it takes a lot of courage to step out of what's always been. And, yeah. um, and so, you yes, know, it does. Those are, the, those are the people that I want to support. And I know that it took me a lot of courage to step out of what's always been. And, mm-hmm. it, you know, I didn't yeah. do it alone. There was a lot of people, you know, reaching down and helping to pull me up along the way. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think any kind of change is, is difficult. But when you're talking about the change of self-exploration, because, you know, we're all so busy and what we want to do is get something, you know, get it integrated into ourselves and then, make it automatic so we don't have to think about it anymore. And right. the reason change is hard is that change forces whatever it is up to back up to the conscious level where you're thinking about it whenever you do something, you know, whenever you're taking a step. And I used to give the example of change is difficult even if you're excited about it, much less if you're tentative, you know, but if you're excited <laughs> right. about it like you buy a new house and, you know, you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you can't remember the layout of the rooms, you know, because it's a new house, and, yeah. you know, it's difficult. You don't know where the lights are, and you're not sure where the bathroom is, and, you know, all that right, goes right. on, and so it calls it up to your conscious mind to think about the next step and what you're doing, and, you know, and, and that that's hard work to have all that stuff in your conscious mind and be thinking about it, so... Well, especially you know, what, in, our, in our culture, we prize happiness and joy. And so sometimes that sense of uncomfortableness we can misinterpret as a sign of failure. Yes. And so then it becomes even harder to stay in that place of change because we're like, but I should be happy about it. I'm doing yeah. something wrong. Yeah, so yeah, ha- I should be comfortable. the ultimate state, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So do you think there's a lot of people who are spiritual nonconformists? You know, I think that there are. They may not say those words to themselves when they go to sleep at night, but I think um, that there are a lot of people that just feel, you know, just kind of wake up and go, God, what's wrong with me? How come I just can't get it together and be okay with this? Mm-hmm. You know, what's mm-hmm. wrong with me? How come I can't just can't go buck up and work for a corporation and get a nine-to-five job and have a happy life um, yeah. because there's something else that's wanting to be expressed in them? Um, and I yeah. think, and there's also a lot of people that maybe – desire a spiritual life but it doesn't fit at a church it doesn't fit you know in a specific book it doesn't fit right. in a specific prescribed religion but yet there's that craving for a connection to something bigger than themselves and yeah. so i do think um I, I do think that that we're at a position in our culture where there's a lot of people um you know what one of my uh colleagues sharif abdullah calls um spiritually starved yes um that there's this hunger for spirituality um, and I yes. also believe that there's a lot of people that are finally, just in the last 10 years, we're finally being given permission to talk about the fact that we don't fit in and, and we don't want to. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there, there is a lot of that. And, you know, I think people want meaning in what they're doing. And, and uh, you know, in so much of our history as human beings, the all of your time and attention has been devoted to survival, you know. And... Uh, we we are devoting our time to survival, but at a higher level of um, uh, spiritual or of uh, material well-being. But now we're saying, wait, there has to be something more than this. I you know I want something out of my life. I'm going to live this long life. I want some meaning in it. I want to have impact. I want to have been here for a reason. I want to you know fulfill myself. I I think there's a lot of that going on. Yeah, studies have shown that you know they do happiness. Um, you know, they do surveys of happiness, and mm-hmm. studies have shown that, that especially where higher wealth and material wealth is concentrated, there's lower levels of happiness. Yes. Yeah. Especially if you have to spend all your time being after it. 